and turn in your King James Bible to the book of Daniel, chapter 2. I want to talk to you today, today about the fifth kingdom of Satan. There are five kingdoms mentioned here in the book of Daniel, and um, a lot of people think that the fifth kingdom is yet to come. Well, my contention is that the fifth kingdom has been here for a long time. Uh, it's the longest lasting of all the kingdoms. And um, I'm going to get into it in this study here. If you've been watching the other studies in this series, you know who would make up this kingdom. I'm going to show you the proof today that it is in fact the Jewish people and the Catholics working together. More specifically, the, the papal Juden, like we prefer to call them, so as to not confuse them with the actual Jews that are there and that actually want to serve God and, and uh, would never join with the Roman Catholic Church. So, but let's read here. Daniel chapter 2, we'll begin in verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of man, men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And the Roman legions certainly did that. The iron, iron legions of Rome is what it's talking about. It's kind of interesting because the metal quality gets more and or gets becomes uh, in more inferior. I'll say it that way: more inferior. Uh, <laughs> um, it goes down in quality from gold to silver to brass to iron, and yet it gets stronger. Gold is not a very strong metal. Um, gold can bend and can scratch and whatever else. That's why a lot of your precious metal coins, they're not pure gold. They will mix in some silver and whatever else so that the coins don't just scratch when you're just barely touching them. Um, you, get, you get like a 4-9 gold coin, it is very, it can get damaged pretty badly and it loses all of its value then. Um, just a little side note there. But iron, <laughs> iron's not a problem, very strong. Verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Stop there for a minute. Now, a lot of people have commented on this. Could this be some kind of iron and clay? Clay being like the flesh, iron being metal, and is it a merger of man and machine? Is that, Are we seeing some kind of artificial intelligence, walking, talking robot type of a thing here? And you know, Well, that's interesting. Or it could be some kind of a return of the Nephilim or something. They will mingle, you know, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Um, and I've thought about both of those. I've probably mentioned those in the, my different sermons down through the years. But after doing this study, I'm convinced that the iron is a reference to the Roman Catholics and the clay, the miry clay, potter's clay, is a reference to the Jews. Now, in order for me to be able to have that as teach that as doctrine, I'd have to prove it from the scriptures, which is what this study is all about. We'll prove it here as we continue. Um, the mingling of seed there is what it's talking about. Mingling of seed is what the Jews were guilty of as they were ending the Old Testament. They were intermarrying with all the different peoples out there, basically destroying the promises that God made to their tribes. 
which tribe are you? Well, you're mingled with a whole bunch of other people. You can't really claim, you know, tribal status anymore to the tribe of Benjamin or Levi or, you know, it's, uh, some of the others, but uh, Judah and, and things like that. Verse 44, And in the, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Um, so, no question here, Daniel got the vision, if you know the whole story there. Uh, the soothsayers and all the magicians and things, they couldn't tell him what the, his dream was, but Daniel could told him what the dream was, and then told him what it, what it meant. But you see here this thing of the Iron Kingdom will bruise. Okay, we'll start out there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Let's go there. There's a few clues here as to who this fifth kingdom is and when it comes in. Genesis 3, and verse 15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay? Um, kind of an interesting thing there, because Satan, there's a prophecy there saying that Satan, you know, thou, speaking to Satan, that's why your King James Bible English is very important, thou is a, it's a singular reference to a particular person, thou shalt bruise his heel. All right. How did Satan bruise the heel of Jesus Christ? How did he you know, put him to death, essentially? Um, he used a certain people to put Jesus to death, to crucify Jesus. Who was it? Rome. It was a Roman cross that Jesus was crucified on. The Roman form of execution. And uh, who was it that, got that, cons that conspired to get him crucified on a Roman cross? Oh, that would have been the Jews of... Jesus' day, the Jewish leadership there. Hmm. But it says that the feet and toes will be part of, quote, potter's clay. Are there any references to potter's clay in the Bible? Jeremiah chapter 18. I mean, you know that there is, or else I wouldn't be preaching this. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 6. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Not, you know, fallen angelic being robot cyborgs. or Potter's clay is a reference to the house of Israel. Compare scripture with scripture. That's what you do. But what, are, what do our divine theologians and our teachers have to say? Well, who cares? If they don't line up with the scriptures, then they're wrong every time. All right. What about the thing iron mixed with miry clay? We saw potter's clay as a reference to Israel. What about miry clay? Psalm 40. Go to Psalm 40. Psalm 40. Verse 2, the Bible says here, He brought me up out, also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. David speaking there. Hmm. And this is the only other reference in the entire Bible to the term miry clay. So miry clay and potter's clay are never ref, you know, referred to, or I should say, should, should say it this way. Gentiles are never referred to as potter's clay or miry clay. Two different references, iron mixed with potter's clay, iron mixed with miry clay, both refer to the Jews. So is there any doubt? No. I mean, first study in this series, you have the thing of the key to understanding the end times. It's about the Jews and the Catholics and the fact that they've been working together for a very long time. And we'll see about that here as we continue. There you have it. I mean, there's no question what's going on. 
things are happening in the city of Jerusalem. You have the Antichrist there, and yet the woman rides the beast. There's a woman controlling the Antichrist. And who's the woman? Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Where is she at? She's a city that reigns over the kings of the earth. Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican. It's right there. It's not America or some other kind of magical little thing that somebody came up with. It's clear to anybody that can see things and interpret, you know, just reality, really. Uh, anybody disagrees with this, well, they're disagreeing with the scriptures. Um, but it says there, back in Daniel chapter 2, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. What about the thing of mingle? Ezra chapter 9. Go to Ezra chapter 9. Back a few books before the book of Psalms. Ezra chapter 9. We'll read verses 1 through 4. It says here, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations. Even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites, listing other ethnicities, other races of people. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. And, that, you know, again, all integrationists, they'll all say, it was about idol worship. That's all it was about. God didn't care if they intermarried. This verse completely destroys that whole thing. Yeah, they're going after other gods, but why do you do that? Because you got married to somebody from a different kindred. And they have different gods. They have different beliefs. That's what it's all about. God wants to, to preserve unique ethnic groups. He wants cultural diversity. God does not want globalism with everybody coming together and having all things in common and whatever else. God does not want that. Remember the Tower of... of, uh, of oh, man, I just completely forgot the thing. Tower of Babel. <laughs> Remember that. God comes down and he sees the people are all to coming together. They all have one language, one speech. And he says, okay, I'm going to confound their, their speech. Split them up. God wants diversity. I don't, again, I don't understand that. I'm the bad guy. I'm a racist because I say there should be segregation. And yet, if they're the opposite of what I teach is everybody comes together and eliminates their differences. Uh, that would be true racism. Elimination of races. But what do I know? Verse 3, And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle, and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard, and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel, because of the transgression of those that had been carried away, and I sat astonished unto the evening sacrifice. It should be a very great, horrible thing. I mean, you know, again, why did God make such a big deal about the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob. And he gives each one an inheritance. He says prophecy about each one. And then they go and they intermarry and they go and inter intermarry with the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Amorites, and, you know, the whole list that's right there, the Hittites and everything. And they're going and they're intermarrying. How can you claim that you're of a certain tribe if you're intermarried with other people? And you, you know, you go and you get somebody else and they say, um, I have this tradition that we do at this certain time of the year or, or I like to eat this food or whatever else. And you have actual medical doctors like Weston A. Price and he goes and he's studying cultures that are separated from other people and they have their own foods, their own things that they eat all from the local area and they're incredibly healthy. Weston A. Price was a dentist and he's looking and he's saying these people have no cavities at all when they're separated from the Western world and eating their pure kindred diet. That's a good thing. There's an inheritance there to all the different races that are out there, ethnicities, whatever you want to call it. Again, I get people all upset about that. It's right there. A Jew doesn't do good on pork. I'm German. I do great on pork. We had it this morning, pork tenderloin. Um, yeah, I feel wonderful. People, pork's not good for you. Well, maybe for you it isn't, but it is for me. Now, what would happen if I got a Jewish wife? She would either have to start eating pork or I'd have to stop eating pork. Oh, it's such a horrible, terrible thing, Brian. You, you shouldn't be teaching this. Yeah, okay. 
Psalm 106. I mean, I, I understand. We're in the end times. I understand that uh, the time will come will not, when they will not endorse sound doctrine. I get it. I understand it's supposed to be like this, but it's still, it still is frustrating. You know, Lord Jesus Christ, when he came down here to the earth, there are many times that he marveled at their unbelief. Well, he's God manifest in the flesh. He would certainly know about people's unbelief, but he still marveled at it. It was still a thing of, you know, it amazes me sometimes how many people just have no common sense and can't just see things plainly. Psalm 106, verse 34. They did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. I mean, again, oh, well, you're, it's just your opinion about the thing that they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men and whatever. It's not my opinion. Just do a word study search. Mingled. What does it mean? Go through. Look what happens when mingled when seed gets mingled with other seed. It's a problem. It's not, oh, this is wonderful. I think this is great. Yeah, look at the people. They're intermarrying. They're mingling each other with each other. Wonderful. All that culture that I created way back when and, and all the work that I put into making the different races and death, different ethnicities and the beautiful diversity of it all, I can just all mingle and just mix all together. <sighs> You know, you go into the, you know, come back from the, go into the spring here locally and I have some pure spring water and I have a thing of gasoline and a thing of diesel and a thing of motor oil and I just say, let me just blend it all together. <laughs> well, there's no difference. <laughs> okay. Verse 36. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works, and went a-whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. And he gave them into the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Huh. Like the Romans ruling over the Jews there in the first century when Jesus was there? Mm -hmm. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel, and were brought low for their iniquity. What's the counsel all about? They're counseling with the Roman authorities. Hmm. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction and he, when he heard their cry, and he remembered them for his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. He made them also to be pitied of all those that uh, carried them captives. Save us, O Lord our God, and get, gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye the Lord. So, Again, a lot of people that are out there, they study the thing of the Jews and they see the collusion with Rome. They think, oh, they, they control Rome, which is insane. But, you know, oh, they control Rome and all this other stuff. They, they built the Federal Reserve and they did all these other things. All this corruption and all the bad stuff in the world is blamed on the Jews. And so, therefore, God's done with them. Uh, no, he's not done with them. That's the time of, the Jacob, the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what this whole study is about. God's going to put an end to the Catholic Church. He's going to get rid of Jezebel, and Ahab, representing Israel, is going to be corrected, and he's going to repent. That's what's going to happen. Then the new covenant comes in. The new covenant is not here right now. This is the New Testament, not the new covenant. All right, again, I have a whole study on that. You can watch that. Get into all the scriptures. Uh, I know that your little group that you're part of, or the YouTube videos that you subscribe to, or whatever else, that they don't teach that, so I must be a heretic or something, but... If you actually take the time to search the scriptures, you'll see that I'm right. But uh, go next to John 19. And as we're turning, I'd like to ask you a very simple question. You say, well, Ryan, I, I do appreciate what you're saying, but, you know, um, I don't think we're in the fifth kingdom. Okay, then I have a very simple question for you. Turn to John 19, by the way, while you're doing this. Um, <clears throat> is Rome 
still a mighty kingdom? Are we still living under the iron legions of Rome? Do we see the iron legions marching by on the streets and things? No. No. Uh, well, it's there in a veiled manner, isn't it? Please. Uh, no. Rome is no longer a world power. All right. Well, then, if that's true, we can agree on that. I think most people with common sense would say, yeah, that's true. Rome is no longer a mighty power. You don't see the Roman armies going out conquering things. Okay. So, the fourth kingdom is done. So, either the fifth kingdom has been in now for a while, or the fifth kingdom, we're waiting for it, and there's a pause between the fourth and the fifth kingdom. And my challenge to you out there, if that's what you believe, show it to me. Show me where there's a pause between kingdom, kingdoms. The Babylonian kingdom is there. The media Persian rises immediately out of it. Then it goes to the Greek. Then it goes to the Roman. There's no big pauses of a thousand years or hundreds of years or something that I can see from my study, but correct me if I'm wrong. If we're still waiting on the fifth kingdom, then either the fourth kingdom has to still be here, which it clearly isn't, or there's supposed to be a pause between those two kingdoms, which I don't see from Scripture. Um, I see a kingdom that's there, that Rome still does things, but that miry clay is also there. And the Jews and the Romans come together, and they're doing things and conspiring and doing other, you know, whatever types of uh, financial things, wars, and whatever else, because war makes the most money. And so the uh, people, Juden, they're into the merchant thing, they're into the money. They'll make the money, they'll do the dirty work for the Vatican. The Vatican will go out and do the military work. And it's part weak, part strong. There's times during the Dark Ages that it was they controlled everything. Rome controlled everything. Other times during the Protestant Reformation, they lost a lot of their power. And then there was things here in America where there was you know some Roman strength, and then people Juden, they were doing a bunch of things as well. Um, so I see the part weak, part strong thing. I see the mingling. Uh, again, you can watch videos, you can do the research. I'll be bringing out more stuff on this in the future. But a lot of these Jews, they were ashamed of themselves. They were ashamed of their, you know, kind of hooked noses and whatever. And they literally admit, it's not me, it's not, you know, anti-Semitism or some kind of dumb thing like that. No, no, they admit that they have intermarried with different white German families, British families, French, whatever, Italians. They'll intermarry, they mingle themselves for political and financial reasons. That's what they do. It's a historical fact. There's nothing racist or prejudiced or hateful or bigoted or whatever you want to say. None of that stuff is there. It's historical fact. And it lines up with what the Bible says, that they would mingle, that there'd be a mingling of the seed, the holy seed of Israel. They're supposed to stay separate. They're not supposed to intermarry. God has a plan for them in the future, for the 12 tribes in the future. But they've mingled and they're mixing in all this other stuff to get financial gain. And they've been in bed with the Roman Catholic Church for centuries. Let's read here. John chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. He's had his Roman trial, and he comes back to the Jews and says, There's no fault in this guy. He didn't do anything wrong. We mocked him a little bit, whatever else, scourged him, let him go. Uh, then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. Jesus took the beating better than anybody else that Pilate had ever seen. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, at saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, 
Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Um, who gave Nebuchadnezzar his power? That would have been God. Who gave the, gave the media Persian kingdom their power? God. How about the Greek Empire? Uh, God. How about the iron, the Roman? God. And here you have God manifest in the flesh. And he's there and he says, you wouldn't have any power at all. Except the Lord, you know, except I gave it to you. Is what he's saying there. Given thee from above. Which the Father's in heaven, Jesus Christ the Son is on the earth. But the Father and the Son are one being. They're not two separate beings. They're separate in, in terms of body and soul. That is true. All right, please understand the Godhead doctrine. Um, that's there. But they're the same being. There aren't two different gods. There's only one God. Verse 12. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Hmm. So the Jews aren't saying, Hey, you know, wait a second, this, this is a Jewish matter. We don't have any, anything to do with the Romans. Come on here, you were just under your captivity. They're working with the Romans. And they're, they're using Roman authority to, to say to Pilate, hey, you better do this thing, or you're, you're going to be, you're not Caesar's friend. Hmm. Um, verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. I mean, what more proof do you need? There's collusion between the Jews, the Jewish hierarchy, the Sanhedrin, whatever you want to call them. There's collusion between them and Caesar, between the Jews and the Romans. It's crystal clear. It was the fifth kingdom yeah, there at that point in time? I think that that's when it happened, quite frankly. I think that that's when the Roman power was diminished and now it became part iron, part miry clay. That's what I believe. I'd like to hear your thoughts. Put it in the comment section down below. Um, verse 16. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the, the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The title then read, this title then read, Many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Interesting that it's representative of the three sons of Noah. Hebrew, Shem. Greek, Japheth. Latin would be Ham. Hmm, interesting. So then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have writ written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Um, so there you have it. Uh, again, Look at the, look at how these two sides are working together. And, and oh, the, the kingdom, fifth kingdom, no, it's a future thing. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. I think it was happening back then. Um, now, we could debate that back and forth. I can't say when they crucified Jesus, when they made that statement, we have no king but Caesar, that's when it started. I don't know. It could have been before that. But um, the Catholics, the Romans, basically took a lot of that Pharisaical, the Pharisee, Sadducee type of system, and they incorporated it into their future church, the Roman Catholic system, where you overthrow scripture by tradition. And you have a lot of religious liberalism and everything else within the Catholic church where they deny certain supernatural things. Some of them do. 
and others don't. So, you know, I can't nail it right down to an exact, okay, yeah, when they said we have no king but Caesar, that's when the fifth kingdom started. I don't know, but I believe that the fifth kingdom started at some point in time in that area. Maybe when they said that, maybe it was before, I don't know, but it's right around that area is when the fifth kingdom starts. All right. And um, they continued as the Roman Empire, and it's still there today. And if you look at the Jesuits, you know, what all they're involved in, um, who they train, world leaders that they're training, you look at the scheming that they do, you look at a lot of the other Roman Catholic systems that are out there, they go through this thing of being part weak, part strong. And it's up and down with that system. And it's the same thing with the Jews. The, the Jews that serve the Pope, the Papal Uden, those people, um, there's part weak and part strong with them as well. I just heard literally uh, on the 26th, I think it's the uh, what 20, yeah, 29th today here of February, the 26th, uh, Jacob Rothschild died, uh, finally went home to hell where he belongs. So a very rich, powerful um, servant of the Pope and a man that's a Jew. So um, I'd like to, like I said, please write it in the comments down below. Um, this isn't a real super detailed study because I think I just wanted to get right to the point with this whole thing. And uh, if you have any other scriptures that you can think of that would line up with this or even contradict what I've taught, put them down in the comment section below. Unless you're some kind of a uh, moron, historicist, uh, preterist type of thing. And it all happened in the first century. Okay, then why are the Jews still around? Why, are the, why is the Roman Catholic Church still around? Uh, okay, um, well, it's poetically that, you know, God destroyed the, the Vatican, Mystery Babylon. It's just poetic or something in, in Revelation 17 and 18. Um, it doesn't actually mean that it was, you know, literally destroyed. <laughs> Run along. This is the wrong channel for you. I actually have a brain that works, um, unlike preterists. So um, that's going to be it for this study. Um, we're going to be going on to the fifth and final uh segment in this and um that is the going to be a sermon called the coming kabbalistic kingdom um the jewish because the jews add their traditions their occult traditions which they learn from mingling their seed um they have this kabbalah teaching which goes back it's fairly ancient and they have the babylonian talmud and they have a lot of other satanic teachings because they reject jesus christ as their as their god as their Messiah, not just Messiah, but as their God, um, they reject him. And so they picked up all these occult teachings. And I'm going to show you how they use this thing with Freemasonry and a lot of things. And I'm actually going to show you a Jewish rabbi um, talking about how that Satan is a good thing to the people of Israel. Satan is actually, a, is, he's not bad like the Christians teach. And he says, Satan, you'll see it in the next video. But, um, he actually teaches that Satan is a good thing. <laughs> You'll see the proof. So that is going to be it for this study. And um, see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.